Hello, everyone, and welcome to Shaper Sessions. My name is Jake, and today I'm running solo. Russ is taking a much-earned vacation, but don't worry. Today's going to be a lot of fun because we are focused on fine box hardware hinges specifically. We're going to go over two different types of hinge that can both be found in our hardware catalog. We're going to touch on the uh, neat elite small hinge from fine box hardware and the quadrant hinge from Brusso. And I got a couple of boxes. We're going to put those in today. Before we get into it, a couple of rules of the road. Uh, as always, this is a live show and thank you for joining. Please use the chat feature because all of those good questions are going to end up in our QA section at the end of the show. Um, or you know, all the good ones that we need to demo can be will end up in the end of the show. Any ones that can be answered on the fly, Ted is going to be taking care of that in the chat. We also have a lot of awesome giveaways today. Like I am so excited to be here to offer not only a Shaper Trace to one lucky winner, we also teamed up with our friends at Rubio, and we are giving away a set of Oil Plus 2C for Rubio Monocoat. If you have any questions specifically around Rubio, Natalie is going to be joining us from Rubio in the chat, so you can direct your questions towards her. And, of course, we're also giving away a Shaper Origin. That's right. Uh, due to our recently announced trade-in program, our friend Eric Curtis has graciously sent his tool back to us and we sent and, and traded up to a new Gen 2. He signed that tool, sent it to us. We've completely refurbished it and we are giving it away for free on this show today. So hang out to the end. That's all going to happen at the very end. And I'm super excited for it. <laughs> Let's get into it. Um, we're going to start off with that hard, um, fine box hardware, neat elite hinge and I'm going to cut the first half, and then we're going to go into how exactly we did it. So let's just go right into it. That is the beauty of these hinges. They are so fast. Knock off any fuzz. And before we take anything out, we want to check our fit. Just so we get a look at what we're doing here. This is the small neat elite hinge. It's got a 93 degree stop on it. And this is cut to a zero inch offset, which is just a perfect fit. So let's go ahead and do the other side and we'll walk through start uh, setup start to finish. All right, I am on workstation today. And we chose these two hinges because you can kind of, you have to go about them two different ways. For the neat elite hinge, you can, as you can see, I'm cutting them into the box disassembled each side one at a time. For the quadrant hinge, you actually need to cut into it while the box is fully assembled, glued, and in its final shape. Um, I've made a box that can fit into workstation just for that reason. But we'll talk about if your box is too big to fit into workstation and how we would go about that. Let's go ahead and pop this off and grab our other side. So in the interest of keeping our reference faces the same. I'm using the outside face of my box. This is the outside face as the face that goes against my clamping face and workstation. So I'm going to do the same thing for this piece. Outside face is here, up against workstation, and I'm going to work off of the left hand reference pins. Again, we're just doing one today, so it doesn't really matter where we clamp this down, but it's good practice to always use those reference pins. There we go.
and there we go. So because we're using that back edge, what we're going to do is actually probe off of our workstation clamping face, followed by this edge of the box joint. Try to do things right around here. We're going to use the engraving bit because it has a solid 0.25 inch shank, and that makes for an excellent probe when you're making a grid. Okay, from the top, we're going to scan. No, new scan. Get a nice clear image of the top of our piece. And we are going to grid. Just to give you an idea of where I'm at here. Going to contact that clamping face, probe, come all the way around, probe. And I need to make sure that I change my probe face before I go for that last probe because it's assuming you want to use the middle. And the only reason for that is because it's because I am between point one and point two, uh, probe one and probe two. So I need to change that manually. Let's grab our file from our hardware catalog. And we just need to rotate 90 degrees. See, it's got that custom anchor point that's actually going to, that is slightly inset so that the cut extends past the material. And I'm going to use position to put it exactly in the middle of this piece of half inch oak. So that is negative 0.25. Bingo. Now I like to cut these box sides first before I cut the lid. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to assemble the box and take a real world measurement. Say as I look for my calipers, there they are. A real world me measurement of where these things landed and that's what I'm going to cut into the lid. Always like to Z-touch directly off the top of my material. Whenever possible, it's also OK to Z-touch on the top of workstation. Now let's go for it. Give it a double check. <laughs> Most of these hinges are so precisely machined, they're all going to fit, but it's always good to double check that you don't need to give a negative offset for fitment. Oop, but that is perfect. All right. Moving on to the lid itself. going to do all of this work on the shelf. So I need to drop down. To the middle on my workstation. Get these clamps out of the way. And bring in the shelf. Okay, 
putting my hinges right here. We're doing a long way opening box. So I'm just going to keep those closer to the workstation body just so the weight of origin is all central and not hanging all the way out here. I absolutely could do this sideways too, cut the hinges here, but why not? Keep it straightforward. This is when one of those moments that just makes the shelf really shine for me because this piece is about half of an inch, but it's not perfect. I just knew I wanted it around half of an inch. And instead of having to get another piece that is exactly the same thickness, I can just bring it up to the top of workstation and know that everything's going to be flush. Nice. A little double sided tape. Two pieces for good measure. We're going to be gritting directly off of this piece. So where I place it relevant, relevant, relative to the workstation is less important. Okay, back to that engraving bit. This time, you might have noticed this, I have the engraving bit in the proper way instead of backwards because we're going to be doing a center line grid where we actually make a mark and line our grid up using the point of this engraving bit like a stylus. We're going to center it on this door or on this lid. First things first, let's go ahead and find the center of our lid. Ooh, that is on the money. Okay. So exactly two and a half. Gonna darken that score mark with a pencil. And I may have forgotten my mallet, so I might have to jump off stage. But as I assemble this, we can take a real world me measurement of where those two hinges land. And I like doing this because you never know what's gonna change in your material, uh, subtle differences in how deep you cut your box joints. So you, I want to see exactly where those hinges lie naturally. <laughs> hey, <-o>. thanks. <laughs> All right, slide my bottom in. P.S. This is one of my favorite way to, ways to make box bottoms. It's just slats, but you do a subtle round over in between each one. Just gives it a nice texture. Does it make it slightly difficult to assemble? Yes. There we go. All right, mind your ears. Beautiful. All 
All right, so from the center of each of these cuts, we are at Four point five two. Nice. Four four point five two. Now that's going to be the distance between from center to center of our hinges for our lid. Let's go ahead and scan this in. And if I was doing a couple of these, I would make sure that everything is set up with reference faces, especially the lid, so I could just cut it, reset, and continue on. But since we're doing one-offs here, it's okay. We can see our center mark. So let's create a grid. Drop it down. using the edge closest to us. Touch, touch that back edge. One, two. Now lift your probe back up and bring it down slowly until it is just above your material and just above your pencil line. Now I'm looking directly at that pencil line and that bit and dropping my last probe. That, my friends, is a center line grid. Super handy if you're out in the middle of a large panel, um, middle of a tabletop, something that doesn't fit maybe inside of the window of plate, because this is a perfect job for the reticle of plate. Um, but we're on workstation today, so we're doing this. Go ahead and bring in that same hinge. And from the center at y equals zero, so it stays on that line, we're going to go position x, what do we say, 4.52 divided by 2. Place. Let's do it one more time. Position 4.52 divided by 2 equals, but now we're going in the negative direction. Boom. And voila. Great. Now I've sized this lid to be more or less the same exact size as the box. So could I have just used my edges and positioned from there? Yes. But if, let's say, your box lid is slightly undersized or oversized, I want to get rid of that chance that we're not going to be lined up with our hinges. So using real-life measurements is always the best way to go. Switch back over to our quarter inch. And everything today can be done with a standard quarter inch bit that comes with Origin. Hit it with a Z touch. Bingo. And I'm going to run through and do both of these real quick.
go. Knock off any fuzz. And test fit before we pry this off. Beautiful. I'm happy with it. Bring our box over. Excellent fit. Now, I don't have the screws in there, so bear with me. But I'm quite happy with that. Very neat little hitch hinges. Again, excellent catch, excellent action. There you go. All right, let's go ahead and head into a little break before we jump into the quadrant hinge. Set that aside for now. Uh, around now is when the poll question should be popping up. And we are curious. In two weeks' time, idea, IWF is happening in Atlanta. We're going, and we're curious, are you as well? And if not, what kind of woodworking shows do you go to? Or big tool conventions or things like that? I also want to announce, or announce again, the trace case. Now, I will not be giving away a trace case today, but I will be giving away a trace. All you need to do is answer that poll question to put your name in the running for either a trace, a can of Rubio Monaco, or an origin. All right. Uh, at Speaking of the origin, we're going to be doing another one of these, uh, the origin giveaways, as well as another Rubio giveaway. So keep your ear to the ground for that. We'll announce it soon. And now is a good time to release the additional gift for Rubio, a little discount code for everyone that's here today. Uh, that is going to be shared in the chat, so keep your eye out for that in the live chat. Um, that is good between the 25th to the 31st of July. So use it before you lose it. And thank you very much, Rubio, for sharing that with us. Today's shop tour was shared with us by Jim, if we're ready to share that. Queuing it up now. All right. All right. Welcome to my shop. This is a uh, custom built 24 by 28 garage. It's got a man cave up top and a workshop on the bottom. So let me walk you through and show you what we got. So here's the shop. It's basically 24 by 28. It's a good, good view of it all around. Um, so it's kind of designed around a central, central design uh, area, this island here where we have my table saw, uh, band saw, joiner planer, and edge, uh, edge sander. And we'll talk about each of those. Um, over here I have um, edge sander, or excuse me, a, a drum sander and a panther router, um, occasionally TV when I want to watch. I have more wood storage up above the garage doors. Here we have a, uh, a workstation that I built, uh, basically according to the plans from Jay Bates. Um, I did incorporate some cool other features to it though. Um, so one of them is this rigid sander is on a, a platform that um, is collapsible, goes back into the, in the uh, cabinet there when I'm not using it. Behind it, I have my uh, sharpeners for my lathe tools, uh, more, more wood storage, mostly slabs and that, that kind of stuff. Um, here's my Bosch um, miter saw with one cool feature I like to show is that it has this uh, shadow line um, that, that always shows you where the blade is so you know exactly where the blade is gonna cut. Works better than a laser, uh, in my opinion. Um, and so we, here we have more drawers and more storage areas um, for all the other tools that I have. 
Another neat little feature on this is that this um, belt sander, disc sander uh, racks out of the cabinet, and so I can put it back when I, when I don't need it. Um, here we have my uh, router table, basically built on the plans from uh, Alm Fab, Mike Alm's uh, plans are really good plans. Uh, and then we have uh, a Nova DVR um, lathe, which I really like. It's a really nice tool to work with. Uh, more wood storage over here. Um, I also have a, a floor sweep and central vac uh, system for dust collection. So I can just vacuum everything into that central um, vac here and these gates open and close and, and uh, use that. They're all connected on a uh, automatic uh, dust collection system there you can see those that gate valve opens up automatically once it senses the uh, current from the machines uh, that's done by grid automation which is pretty pretty nice um, so here's the we have a restroom here uh, and then we have a uh, the uh, jet 17 inch um, drill press here we have uh, the hammer a331 joiner planer combination tool great tool to work with here's the um, edge sander that I built um, and then here is the kind of the central dust collection system so all these tools here these four tools here uh, port their dust um, to this uh, this unit here and it comes across underneath the concrete into the Laguna dust collection here there's where it comes up and then we have um, in this room my air compressor and a bunch of more tools and storage areas and that kind of stuff uh, up here is the uh, stairway to the man cave. Uh, here we have more um, wood storage and scrap storage and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and then over here we have the computer. But I do a lot of my kind of work over here with computer. And here's where I store all my shaper tools. Um, and then I have a storage area for my finishing products. I just recently put in a French cleat wall. I haven't really populated it yet, but hope to do so soon. And then here we have more clamps and then a whiteboard and then uh, kind of finishing up with um, more more wood storage up there that I'm using. Uh, one of these Husky uh, 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 work tables that work really well. You can adjust your height. Uh, here's my Panda router I use occasionally. And then uh, my assembly table as well as a, you know another portable dust collector. So that's kind of my shop. Uh, any questions? I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, thanks. Take care. Right on, Jim. Thank you so much for sh sharing that with us. Uh, great collection of tools. We also have the same uh, router planer set up. Uh, we have the two individuals. and Absolutely love it. Uh, am I the only one that was kind of disappointed that we didn't get a tour of the man cave as well? But hey, it's pretty cool that it's right above your shop. Thank you, and... We'll send you something special for sending us that. So thanks. Uh, if you want to share your shop tour, we would absolutely love to see it. Send it to sessions at shapertools.com and it'll get on the list. We'll play it eventually. Cool. I think we can bring that poll question down if it's not already down um, and get into the quadrant hinge. So this is the one where we have the fully assembled box. I went ahead and cut one side of it already, just for the sake of time. I'm going to clamp this up into our workstation. All right. There we go. Not putting a ton of weight on this, so it is okay that this is so far out here. What's important that it's as, as nice and tight and up against our clamping face and our support bar. So, quadrant hinge has an interesting little addition to it. It has a catch. Now, this catch looks super cool when it's when it's opened, but it needs somewhere to go when it's closed. Now in the file, it's going to suggest 
that you split this little mortise here, three quarters on one side, three quarters on the other side. Depending on the type of box you're making, that's totally fine. I am making uh, a lid out of solid material that is five eighths thick, so I don't want to go three quarter into that. So what I did was just move the numbers around a little bit. I went an inch deep on this mortise, and I'm going to go half an inch deep on the lid mortise. Same amount of space for that little catch to hide, um, but allows me to get a thinner top. Let's go ahead and scan it in. And swap to our probe. Same dealio as before. We're sneaking behind the material here. We're going to contact the back or the face that's pressed up against that clamping face. One, two, and three. All right, hop into import, grab that. Brusso quadrant hinge, the 638. And I've already done my right side. I'm going to use this left side and rotate it 180. The custom anchor point for this particular hinge gives you enough offset so that you go that you cut past the back side leaving room for the actual knuckle of the hinge, but it does line you up right with the outside edge. So it's up to you to determine how far you in you want that in from your edge. In my case, I want it the X direction, three, 30 seconds in the negative direction. Perfect. Go ahead and Z-touch directly off on your material. And we'll start with a pocket, switch to an inside, and we'll do that mortise down to an inch deep. Here we go. Excellent. So the when I said earlier that you can do all of these projects with just the standard three quarter inch or quarter inch bit that comes with Origin, that is true. But for this inch deep uh, mortise that we just made, it's really important that you 
make sure that the helixing function is turned on because we can't go to a one inch depth with the stock bit and try to do a finish pass because then we're not, we don't have enough cutting flutes. We have three quarters of an inch long cutting flutes. We do sell a quarter inch bit that goes up to an inch in cutting flute length, uh, which I highly recommend because sometimes you just need that. You need to do an inch deep finish pass. But for this, Helix works just fine. Get yourself one of these sanding sticks too. Real lifesaver for knocking the fuzz off from an upcut bit. Do a little test fit before we take it out. Because if we need to take a thousandth of an inch off here or there, would rather do it now. Feels like it couldn't hurt to take off. Maybe two. Uh, that's a pretty darn good fit. I'm going to leave it. I'm happy with it. Just got to be ta careful taking it in and out. Hold back. In. There we go. Two, part one done. Second part is very similar. We're going to take a real world measurement off of that. Use a center line grid. Place base off that center line grid. This one inch stuff comes in real handy when you're not. Like for this, I don't need to put a giant strip all the way across. I'm not cutting too deep into it. Confidence not gonna move, just needs a little bit of hold down. Do yourself a favor too, as you're planning out this whole thing, go ahead and mark, you know, choose which face and which edge you want to be visible of your box and mark which locations you're gonna put your hinge, even just a squiggle to give you an idea of, ah, that's the inside of my lid. Okay. Real-world measurement. And we're doing this from the very edge here. I don't know if you can see that in the overhead. But right where that cut starts, we stepped in 3 30 seconds of an inch. So our measurement starts from that. We are right at... burning an inch, so it's eight and three quarters. No. Yeah, eight and three quarters on the money. This is where measure twice, cut once really comes into play when you're doing it live. Yes, eight and three quarters. All right. Back to that engraving bit. Scan it in. These are the times too. I very rarely remove that dust shield unless I'm trying to do a center point grid. I want to be able to see exactly where that point is. But notice my spindle's not even plugged in. Never gonna turn my tool on. 
while my dust port is off or my finger guard is off. Start off with the grid, sneak down behind, and change that edge. Yeah, one, two. Notice how I like to spread those two points out as much as I can. Lift the bit and lower just above the material. Tiny little taps of the green button is going to lower it every so slightly. Bam. Lots of spindle swaps today. It's all right. That's why we got multiple spindles. Cool. Before I forget, I'll Z touch. We're not even taking this bit in and out, but because I'm taking the spindle in and out, it's just best practice to refresh that Z touch. That's a good habit. All right, let's do some math. Or let's actually, let's have Origin do some math for us. I'm gonna grab this one, rotate 180, and position at 8.75 divided by two. I want to go to the left, so that's in the whoops, negative direction. Bingo. Same thing here. Rotate 180, position 8.75, divide by two. Wrong direction. There we go. Now the key thing I need to remember when going through this is that I am cutting these mortises to half inch instead of one inch or instead of three quarter like it's suggesting. If you have a lid that's thicker than three quarter of an inch, by all means just split the difference three quarter in the body of the box, three quarter in the lid, but thinner lid, gotta move it around. All right, let's hit it. Point zero
Excellent. Now, quick note, note on where to plunge in a cut like this, especially when we're dealing with potentially fragile grain. Grain's running this direction. This little bit right here can get pretty fragile when we are uh, when we're cutting it. We don't want to blow that out. So as I'm plunging, I'm considering the rotation of the bit. In this case, we're going this way. So if I plunge right there, right where it's likely to chip out, it's going to be a little less likely to chip out there. Same thing over here. I was a little worried I was going to chip out here. So I plunge there, cut that first really gingerly. Taking the time to do this because I don't want to get it to get in the way of my hinge. Well, vacuum. Let's see if it comes together. Yes, easier to actually get this support rod in when the hinge is closed than it is to try to do it when it's open. This is that tight one, so I'm just going to be real careful not to mess with the grain too much, or not to blow out that edge. Nice. Oh boy. I guess I deserve that for trying to do the lid first. Do this in reverse. So far, the hardest part about this, just lining them up. There we go. Bear with me. For the sake of time and my patience, we're just going to do without that guy.
this might be an example of why you take a few thousandths of an inch off. Because it fits too good, you're just going to wrestle with it when it's actually time to put together. There we go. Thanks for bearing with me there, folks. <laughs> Stay. There we go. Another about 95 degree open. And depending on what you're looking for, I quite like the look of the little brass rainbow there. It's pretty cool. Fine box hard with, or with origin. Thank you very much for watching.